a little bit about our panelists here today. Chuck Adams is an executive editor at Algonquin Books. He worked previously as an editor at Simon & Schuster and has been in publishing for over 30 years. Sally Hill McMillan formed her agency in 1990 out of Charlotte, North Carolina and represents an eclectic range of fiction and nonfiction writers in the Southeast. My first question is for you, Sally. What motivates you as a literary agent? I would say probably the same thing that motivates me also motivates everybody in this room. I have uh, a lifelong love of books, not just um, the words, but the feel, the touch, the look, the whole thing. And um, I didn't just rise up out of the ashes and become an agent. I, um, I started down the road at the University of North Carolina Press when my husband was in law school and spent three years falling in love with publishing after three years of feeling like I gave my life to the Peace Corps because I was a high school teacher. And uh, it wasn't for me. So when I started out at the University Press, it was really just to have a job so I could support my husband through law school. But it ended up being that I fell in love with it and something that I've you know, carried with me the rest of my life. But of course, like most lawyers, my husband decided he needed to go back home to practice law because that's where his client base would be. And I had an offer at Columbia University Press in New York, but he would not go up there. So we almost split, but somehow we hung in together. And I went to Charlotte and started a company with the help of two absentee partners, which is the best way to have partners, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and I ran the company for about 10 years until my second daughter was born and uh, couldn't find anybody to help me run it. So I sold it to a company that was owned by the Boston Globe. It's called Globe Pequot Press. And uh, they bought our company. And at the time, our company, which was Eastwoods Press, and Globe Pequot Press were about the same size. And they merged the two together. And I stayed with them for three years, acquiring books. It was a, a dream job because I could do it out of my home in my pajamas. and. Um, still run after my kids and I loved it but after about three years it, w it became more difficult to do at long distance they were operating the firm <coughs> out of Connecticut so uh, and about that time I had a couple of my authors come to me and ask me to help them get a book published that was not right for Globe Pequot so that's how I sort of left the publisher's desk stood up walked around to the other side of the desk and became an agent and uh, those first few years were rough, but um, once I got, got it running, uh, it's been actually uh, a lot of fun to run it from the South. That's an awesome answer. Uh, Chuck, for our audience here today, uh, could you tell us a little bit about what an editor at a major publisher does from acquisition to publication? What does an editor do? Well, an editor has to be the publisher of the book, in essence. Uh, there's, of course, a publisher, and there's a marketing director, and there's a publicity director, and you w all those people you work with, but you have to make sure that they listen to you. You have to be the advocate for your book. So when you buy it uh, from an agent, usually, uh, you work with the author, you edit it, you get it in shape, then you start working with the art department to be sure they kind of come up with the right jacket for it. Then you talk to the publicity department about how they're going to publicize it, et cetera, et cetera. You just have to stay on top of it. You can't just put it out there and assume that this factory is going to take care of it. If you do, it'll get lost. So it's, it's a, being a constant advocate for your books. And similar question uh, for you, Sally. What is it that a literary agent does for our audience today? What, what does a literary agent do? For her audience do? or for her? Oh, no, for our audience here today. Okay. What oh. is your, from, from the point where you find a new author that you're interested in representing, could you talk about sure. a little bit of what you do? Yes, what an agent does, and the first and foremost is an agent is selective and has a certain kind of taste or a certain kind of following that she or he likes and so it's very important when you go looking for an agent that you find one that's a good fit for you but once you once an agent decides this is a book that I can do I have 12 or 15 contacts of mine that I know would be interested in reading this book then um, an agent takes on that client um, some agents just take on just books. I tend to look down the road and see if it's, a, if it's more than just one book. But in any case, what you do is you do it all. I mean, you basically try to help 
the author uh, formulate the proposal that has to be pitched to um, to make it work for you. You sometimes you have to rewrite a lot of things just to get it right, and then you begin pitching it to editors. And um, you know that's the sort of mysterious hard part of it is trying to find the right match. And to me, that's the most important thing, not just trying to find the right deal, but to try to find the right match for that client's first book so that it mm -hmm. will be an, uh, an easy way for her to enter the publishing uh, industry and also a way that's going to help the next book that comes along. Um, I mean, I could talk for another hour on what an agent does. I don't think you want that, so. I'll just I don't know. I think, uh, how would you guys like to hear a little bit more? Um, but keeping things rolling a little bit, uh, in the Poets and Writers interview, which formed the basis of a lot of the questions that I have, it's an outstanding interview. We have a copy here if you want to show everybody. A Chuck was just interviewed uh, in an exclusive interview in Poets and Writers that was about 18 pages when I printed it up from my printer last night. Um, one of the things that I was most fascinated by, uh, there was a lot of things, but one of the things I was most fascinated by was, of course, Water for Elephants and the particular <coughs> marketing strategy or technique that the marketing director at Algonquin used in contacting uh, independent booksellers. And it, it speaks to the power of independent booksellers. Can you talk a little bit about that for well, folks sure. who aren't familiar? Uh, I, as you mentioned, I worked in Simon & Schuster for many, many years, 15 years, and um, was pretty jaded. Um, their marketing is is basically buying ad space in the mag in the t New York Times if we can afford it or wherever. But they don't really they don't really try to market books in a, in, too aggressively uh, unless you've paid a lot of money for them. Uh, at Algonquin, because it's such a small company and there's no bid list, we, every book has to has to matter at a house like that. Um, the marketing director read Water for Elephants and walked into my office and said, "This could be a bestseller." He said, "I can." I can sell this to, I can, can get, give this to my mother, I can give this to my father, I can give this to my wife, I can give this to my old college roommate. It's universal. Everybody will enjoy this book. He said, we can make this a bestseller. And I said, well, you just go right ahead, make it a bestseller. <laughs> and, and he got on the phone to bookstores. Called, he has pers a personal relationship with a lot of bookstores all around the country, travels all the time to go to these various uh, bookstore events around the country. and. Um, said, I'm going to be sending you a manuscript. I want you to read it. I think you're going to love it. If you do, then give me a review. Write a review. I'm going to put together an ad with your reviews. So that's what he did. He sent out about 25 manuscripts to bookstores all around the country. We started getting back amazing feedback from them. Um, th when we, we were coming up on, the B on BEA, which is every year with this book expo, they call it, where all the independent book booksellers around the country come together and all the publishers put up big elaborate booths <coughs> and, and hawk the books we've got coming up over the next year. And it was decided, I'm not sure this was in the article, but it was decided, uh, the people who run the BEA decided they were going to make uh, Water for Elephants a, an event book at that year's BEA, that they were going to push it and try to make a show that the independent booksellers could make a bestseller. Because so, so many of the publishers rely on Barnes & Noble uh, and Borders to make a book. And here they said, we're going to do it with the independents. Not that Barnes and & Noble and Borders didn't sell copies, they did, but they weren't on board at the same time and at the same level as independent booksellers. So it was remarkable to see the independent bookstores, the power that they do have. I hadn't realized it because you, you hear so much about how, how they're being forced out of business by the, by the big, big companies and so forth, the bigger bookstores, the chains. And uh, to know that they have this kind of power still was just really gratifying and, and, and I appreciate it. I want to see it happen again, please. Mm. <laughs> For those of you who aren't aware, uh, Chuck was the uh, editor at Algonquin who acquired Water for Elephants, which became yeah. the bestseller uh, that it is today. Uh, I want to go ahead and get started with the note cards, if we could, getting those passed around. Again, the way we're going to do questions here, because we have so many folks, it would be a little bit chaotic to take questions by hand, uh, by raising a hand. So if you would, write your question down on the note card. Uh, we'll take those up in about 10 or 15 minutes, and then we'll, we'll go through those. If you want to put your name on there, I'd encourage you to do that as well so I can mention your name when we ask the question. Uh, my next question is for, for you, Sally, kind of talking about, we just talked about Water for Elephants and how it became uh, a bestseller, maybe somewhat unanticipated. 
by you, it sounds like a little bit. Like you said, you had been well, in publishing I, a long I time. Well, I personally didn't think. I mean, I read the book and, and loved it, but I love a lot of books. And that doesn't mean that they're going to be bestsellers. I felt that Sarah Gruen had the potential to be a bestselling author because she, it's, it's so much easier to promote an author than it is a book. And she writes about animals. She'd written about animals in two previous books. And so, and this, this of course, included uh, elephants. So you can get off the book page publicity. You can get her on NPR. You can get her on the talk shows and so forth to talk about uh, her love of animals and how it translates into writing. So I thought we would make Sarah Gruen a bestseller, best-selling author mm -hmm. eventually. I had no idea what would happen with this book, no. <coughs> It's fascinating to hear. It's, it sounds like a lot of factors go into that, which leads into my question for you, Sally. Uh, is it just the quality of the story uh, that creates a best-selling, a successful novel uh, or nonfiction book? Uh, or are there other factors like what we're talking about? What are, what, what's your take on your experience seeing bestsellers uh, and books break out? What is it that makes them break out? Well, of course, I wish I knew the the actual answer to the question, and if so, I would have a lot of bestsellers, you know, every year. But I do think that Chuck hit the nail on the head when he said universal. I think that the books, most of the books that become bestsellers, not all of them, touch people in a way that, you know, man, woman, child, whatever, it's a universal feeling. Uh, the Probably the most recent bestseller I read was the story of Edgar Sautel. I don't know how many of you have read that book, but it's also a story about a dog or about dogs, um, and maybe that was part of the universality of it, but it was definitely the story. It was kind of an Oedipus Hamlet story for America. It was an American <laughs> story. It had a lot of dark side to it, but yet it was humorous and uplifting in some parts, and I don't know. I totally understood why it became a bestseller, and and, a, and an award-winning book. I think, just to, to answer it a little bit more succinctly, I think that it's what makes a bestseller is very mysterious. Um, it has to just somehow um, hit enough people, enough of the time, at the right time, for it to launch itself. And sometimes it takes authors years of building and building and building before they become best-selling authors. And sometimes they, they come running right out the door with one. And actually, I feel sorry for the latter because it's awfully difficult to follow that act with another one. But in any case, I don't feel too sorry for him, but you know, a <laughs> little bit. <laughs> but in any case, I, I just, uh, that's just a mysterious thing, what, what makes a bestseller. And I think it's uh, a bad thing for writers to just try. I think what writers need to do is write for one person, and that is themselves. I just think <coughs> that um, the best books and the and the best-selling books are usually books that are written because the author just had to get it out of her or him. That's an awesome answer. Uh, a little bit of sort of practical knowledge about how publishers work as well, Chuck. You've you've had so much experience over the years. Uh, could you talk a little bit about the difference between being a managing editor? an acquisitions editor, and just an editor? Well, a uh, managing editor is, uh, is a transition uh, uh, job, or at least for me it was a transition job. I was started out in production, and I wanted to get into editorial. So managing editor works with both production and, and editorial. They have to know both sides of it and have to uh, uh, be able to, to speak the language of both. But production is the, is the part of the company that uh, takes care of Getting the print, getting the book to press, getting getting it copy edited, getting it uh, uh, getting it all ready once the editor has turned it in, uh, and the, uh, the the managing editor coordinates everything they do with with what the editors are doing, or actually should write write heard over the editors to make sure they're meeting their deadlines, because production always meets their deadlines and editors never meet their deadlines. <laughs> <laughs> and an acquiring editor is is very much the same thing as an editor. I mean, most editors are acquiring editors. Uh, there are some uh, editors who um, are primarily line editors, and I have done that. Um, one option I had when I left Simon & Schuster was to just go freelance and just become uh, an editor. Uh, I would have been available to work with any writer who wanted, to, wanted to, to, you know, pony up the money for it, and I would take on projects and just edit, and I love doing that. But the most satisfying part of my job is the acquisitions and then seeing the book through, because I said this in this article, in this interview, and it's something I mean, I, I feel so much. I stay in this business because I like falling in love. 
I open, I open a manuscript, open a box that comes in from the agent, or I, op oh, I click online and see this manuscript that's been sent to me, and I start reading, and I want to fall in love every time I do it. It doesn't happen very often. It happened with Water for Elephants. It's happened with a few other books at Algonquin, but usually, usually do that spark doesn't happen, but that's what keeps me going. It's what keeps me feeling young and keeps me wanting to be in this business. If I were just an editor and not acquiring, I wouldn't have that. I wouldn't have that feeling. And I, I just don't want to give it up. So, That's a great answer. Uh, one of the questions that I get a lot from online uh, folks as well as in events like this uh, is how do you get a literary agent? How do, you, uh, how do we as writers uh, woo uh, a literary agent to want to represent our work? Thinking about your active list of clients, how did you first find out about the writers? that you represent? Was it just a query letter? Was it writer's convention? Was it, a, you know, a referral by a friend? Well, I, I've now been an agent for 18 years, so I'll have to say that my most active clients have, have either been with me a very long time or they have come through word of mouth through referrals. But when I first started my agency, I selected a lot of clients from query letters, from writers' conferences, and those kinds of just sort of cold calling. So a little tip is if you can find a young, new agent or one who's moved from one agency to another and maybe is still is trying to pull in some new clients, it's a great way to, uh, to you know, kind of get in the door. Um, the more established or older agents like myself, w probably it's a little bit harder because we already have our steady, you know, client base. But um, I thought about that question as you were asking it. it I, I don't know what the percentage is. I do occasionally still take, I mean, I do read query letters. I don't, uh, if you send one by email, I don't respond unless it's something I want because I just don't have time to do that. If you send it by mail, I do have somebody who who glances at them for me, and if it's something that she thinks I would like to look at, um, she's, you know, so I will read those. Um, but, you know, I just don't have the time anymore to go through uh, personally every query letter that comes across my desk, and I would venture to say that very few agents do. So it sounds like you're just throwing stuff at a wall, and in a way that's what you have to do when you're first starting out. You really have to throw it against the wall. Uh, I would advise you to do your research first and, you know, try to find agents that fit you. Try uh, to put most of your energy into approaching agents who have just started out or who, who have just moved. And if you're very lucky, try to get a referral from a published author uh, who would be, you know, sending your book uh, to her agent or his agent. It's a great, great answer to that. Again, kind of looking at the Poets and Writers interview again as sort of the basis of a question. Uh, in the PW interview, Chuck, you said, for too long in New York, we've been in this culture of publishing what we like and not what readers want. My take on this is, I write here, to, to me the thing that a writer like Stephen King seemed to get so well was that he wrote for a working class audience of ordinary folks just like all of us. Why is it that so few authors get this and that even fewer publishers do? Um, well, that, that's, that statement, first of all, is a little bit odd because uh, I think it's, it, it, it was, that was kind of taken out of context there, too. I, I was talking about um, uh, <coughs> diversity, I believe, in publishing and also about um, how Judith Reagan, this maverick, came on the scene uh, and started uh, publishing books like Rush Limbaugh and Howard Stern and Porno Stars and Wrestling Stars, and these became best-selling books. And they were all books, these were all subjects and all characters that the rest of us had always said, like, no, this is, we're not going to go there, that's, you know, we're just not interested. And she, w she opened my eyes to the fact that, that there is a huge reading public out there, or people who will gladly go and buy books if you give them books that they want to read. And that was the context, I think, for, mm -hmm. the, for that comment. Because <coughs> I do think that too often uh, we get in editors, we get into ruts of, 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 um, of just buying the same kind, publishing the same kinds of books over and over again. And 
not taking stock of what's going out, going on in the country. Uh, it's publishing is very New York centric, and we it, it, it's a very small business. It really is. It's a tiny business, and and everybody's concentrated there, with a few exceptions. And and we're all most of us are white, and 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 most of us uh, came from upper middle class families because you have to have have money behind you before you can work in publishing because they pay you just nothing when you start, and you've got to live in New York City, so you have to have some money from somewhere. So. It's it's a it's mostly uh, prep school kids uh, with money uh, who are white and and they've got one kind of taste and that's it and that's so I feel like it's just been so narrow and mm -hmm. and I think if we were if we could somehow find a way to diversify the business more and 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 bring more a more diverse uh, group of editors in we would be reaching more people with books. I, I just despair over the fact that we, we d we're not growing our audience. It seems to be shrinking rather than getting larger. Mm -hmm. Do you have any thoughts about ways that a publisher could, could do that, could create a platform? I, it's, it's, it's difficult. It's, it's almost one of those catch-22 things because the profit level in publishing is so slim. Um, they, w we, we don't make money particularly. Sometimes we, I mean, Algonquin, ha until Water for Elephants, I don't think it only, ha it only had one profitable year in all those years. And that was when Oprah picked one of the books for Morgan, uh, Robert Morgan's um, um, Gap Creek. Um, and, and with Water for Elephants now, we've had a couple of profitable years. It's just really difficult. Uh, mm -hmm. You would think uh, Algonquin, with, su with such a tiny staff and, and basically low overhead, should be able to make money. We just don't. Uh, it's it's it just it's so difficult in this business. So I don't think they can pay. We can afford to pay higher salaries. That's the problem. We just can't afford it. And and so how you know do, how do you get kids to come in and and sacrifice themselves? Um, it, it just it you, it's almost impossible to attract uh, Asian Americans in, in, into that because they they come out of, of school and and. Uh, they want to make money, and same with same with with the ed more educated Hispanics. They want to make money. They've got to pay off loans and so forth. So they've got to make money to do it, and they can't afford to come into publishing. So I don't I don't see a solution. I really don't. I don't know what what unless somehow we could we could um, uh, uh, get pub more publishing out of New York. Because uh, uh, by the way, Algonquin happens to have an office in Chapel Hill, but it's a New York publisher. Uh, my, my boss is in New York. It's like a facade, it's, which is great. I'm, I'm really happy they kept the facade because I, I get to work down here. But, but we, I, it's really in New York. And, and so publishing is in New York. And it's, it's, it, we need to, I think if we could get more of it out and, and somehow make it, uh, link it better. There, there are all sorts of possibilities of things that are going to happen with the, com with com uh, with the Internet. Um, you mentioned, uh, I think you mentioned the feel of books, and, and, and I, too, I mean, I love the feel. It's a tactile thing. But I think we all have to accept the fact that this is changing. Um, the Kindle is going to be a big thing. Um, I'm about to get one myself because it's, it's just a, a matter of expedience. I can download manuscripts onto a Kindle, and rather than taking a, a big bag full of stuff home every night, I can just take this little slim Kindle and just sit there and just leaf through it. Mm -hmm. And I can see the convenience, and I think we're gonna we're gonna be dealing with with more and more of people starting to read that way, and it's going to become less and less of a tactile thing. Um, and I don't like that, but it's just going to happen. And I think th in some ways that may open up other possibilities publish in publishing for different kinds of books and authors to find uh, an audience where they can't now. But I think it's going to all happen through the internet. That's great. Uh, if we could, if you've got a question written on your note card, pass them, if you're in this section here, towards the, this end of the room. Uh, and my wife Susan here in the red uh, blouse will come by and, and pick those up. Um, great. Thank you. Uh, so I've got a question here for you, Sally. Uh, these are hard-hitting questions, these tough questions that I have here. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I feel like I should have done my homework. <laughs> investigative reporting here. So how do you balance the need to establish a positive relationship and reputation with publishers while fighting for the best deal for your authors? That is probably the most important thing an agent does. It's a very good question. Um, I think I had a lot of good experience um, because I was a middle child. <laughs> so I was constantly having, growing up, having to be the moderator. 
And in a way, an agent needs to be doing that. I mean, I, I consider it one of my most important roles. And one thing that I always try to do when I place a book with an editor is I ask the editor, what can I do to make this relationship smooth, you know, rely on me because this is a client of mine. I value her, him very highly, and I want things to go well. And I also tell the, the author that if she runs into any kind of a stumbling block with her editor, let me know. But I just try to stay in the loop, and I think agents who, who do that tend to have more successful um, relationships with their own clients. Because if, if your client gets into a problem with an editor, if it becomes an adversarial uh, situation, and the, and the agent doesn't stay in the, in the loop and try to smooth things over, then the author's probably not going to be happy, and the agent's, I mean, the editor's probably not going to be happy. And, you know, that comes back to fly in the agent's face. So it's the most, I think, the most important hands on thing that I do every day. And how, I don't know, just like you do with any kind of people, you know, relationship, you just stay in the loop, you try to intuit what's going on behind the scenes, and ask a lot of questions. and figure out solutions. It's just a problem solving thing. That's a great answer. Uh, similar kind of question for you, Chuck. When you were uh, at Simon & Schuster and at Delacorte, um, maybe to some degree at Algonquin too, although their, their, uh, their publishing target and focus is a little bit different than those other publishers that I mentioned, uh, how do you balance the, the need to meet a bottom line? You mentioned Judith Regan and, and publishing stuff that you know is going to make a lot of money. How do you balance that need with, on the other hand, wanting to publish stuff that you feel matters that might not definitely be a bestseller? Um, well, <coughs> we're, we're, first of all, Algonquin is not uh, ever going to be in the same market as, as Judith. I mean, just, we have no, we, we just wouldn't, we never publish those kinds of books. Uh, not because they're not worth publishing, it's just because we have no credibility with publishing anything like that. And uh, we've, got, we've, we've got a great following uh, with bookstores and with readers now who actually know the Algonquin name and the Algonquin brand, if you will. So we are very conscious of buying books that fall within the realm of what our readers expect of us. Um, at the same time, we do have to make money. And we, we want to publish the best books possible. Uh, we have a rule, basically, that uh, we don't take on any book that we don't think can sell 15,000 copies. Uh, it doesn't always work. In fact, it seldom works. Um, <laughs> but we, we go into it believing that. And this does mean that some books, I have to pass on some books that are really excellent. I've read recently some really, really fine novels or fine writing um, in novels that that were just not going to be universal enough to, to, to sell enough copies. They, they were books that I said to, to one of them, I said, I wish we could afford to have a line of books that were just, these are just for, for books that, that we know should be published even though we know they're not going to make any money. Mm -hmm. But we can't do that. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, it's just, it's, it is tough. Uh, I frequently, when an agent sends me a, a novel uh, like that, I will, say, you know, I can't buy this book here because it's just, we, we can't, we won't sell enough copies to justify buying it. But, and if you don't sell this, I think you will, but if you don't sell this, please, please, if I can, I'd like to talk to the author because he or she is so talented and I would like to have a chance to work with them on their next book and see if talking to them now, I can get them to focus on something that would maybe broaden their, their, their readership with the next one out. Um, but it's, you do have to pass on things sometimes that you know are worth uh, publishing that, that people would enjoy reading, but it's just so difficult to reach them. When you think about how many millions of people there are in this country and that most first novels sell under 5,000 copies, it's just heartbreaking. You know that there are more people than 5,000 who would like these books, but how do you reach them? It's just, you, you know, you can't take out ads everywhere. You can't, you know, how do you... What do you put a billboard on, on, on I-95? I mean, what, what do you do? We just, we don't know what to do to, to, to get the word out on some of them. So it's, it, we have to take the ones we feel that can, can have the widest readership. Hmm. It's a tough, it's a tough line to walk, I think. It is. 
Very good. Let's look at a couple of questions that you guys have from the audience. Robin Mayura asks of Sally, what have been the challenges and advantages of being an agent not based in New York? Well, my that's a great question. Uh, my friends in New York, agents and editors, ask this all the time, and, and the agents are really interested, uh, my <laughs> friends in AR, because a lot of them say, boy, what I wouldn't give to be able to, to not have to go to all the functions and not have to feel like I have to, to be visible all the time and just to be able to, you know, use my own time the way I, I know that I need to use it. So I get that from a lot of uh, agents. And um, I think one thing that I have found when I go to New York, and in the early years I had to go, you know, five, six times a year and sometimes stay for a week or two. Um, but when I did, I would find that um, editors were always interested in talking to agents who came from out of town because they knew that they could see the ones in town anytime. And so editors have always gone out of their way to make time for me. So when I go to New York and go on these um, pitching trips, um, I've never had any difficulty getting the doors open and getting in to see people. And so I think in some ways that's a little bit of an advantage. But of course, the advantage, I mean the disadvantages in many ways out, you know, outweigh those advantages. It's very tough. To, um, to try to keep on top of the moving editors in New York when you're not in town. And you, you just have to work it a different way. Um, there's a, a website that I probably use and read much more um, uh, often than most agents have to. It's called Publishers Marketplace, and it kind of gives you a lot of the gossip of what's going on and lets me know when an editor has moved and that, that sort of thing a lot faster than in the old days when all we had was Publishers Weekly magazine in print, you know, and I, by the time it came out, it was old news. So there are, you know, there are, the internet has kind of uh, given us a little bit more of a level playing field, but again, I would not say it's easy. For me, it was just a necessity for me to do what I love to do. And um, in the beginning, I was the only agent between Washington and Miami. Now there's another agent in Charlotte who's a children's agent. Um, at one time there was one in Chapel Hill, but I think she mm -hmm. retired. Um, you know, so we are scattering a little bit. There have been some New York agents who decide that they want to live out their, their old days mm -hmm. outside of the city, and so they take their agency and their clients with them. Uh, <coughs> California has quite a lot of agents. Um, the Ann Arbor, Chicago areas have a number of them. and. There are good agents all over the country, but um, but definitely, I think New, New York, uh, just simply because you're in the heart of publishing, still uh, agents have an advantage there. Have you ever been seriously tempted to to move to the New York area? Too? Oh, when I was young, it's it's where I really wanted to move. I had a sister-in-law who lived there, and I would camp out at her place. But my husband isn't a lawyer, like I said, and you know, <laughs> husband, you know. It, it, I mean, women are always having to make these kinds of choices, so that was a choice I made. Now, I would not live in New York City if you paid me. Mm -hmm. Even though it's a safer place and everything else, I am just older and it, I just would not want to run mm -hmm. through that rat race. I bet Chuck could back me up on that. Mm -hmm. But um, anyway, that's, I guess that's a... That's a great answer. For those who didn't know, Chuck, actually, you grew up in the North Carolina, Virginia. I grew up in Virginia, a tobacco farm, actually, between Danville and Lynchburg. Went to Duke? Went to Duke, uh, for s undergraduate in law school, and then went to New York <coughs> to, thought to be a lawyer, but I segued into publishing. I have no regrets. Another thing that, that was interesting to me in the, uh, in the PW interview was how early in your career, and I suppose maybe even more recently, too, you developed a reputation for working with uh, or for being the editor who could work with uh, problematic yeah. authors. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about well, why I, you had that skill set? I, I don't know. I mean, I think it's. I, I think I said in the in the article that um, my therapist said that it, because I came from abusive uh, uh, situation and. Um, uh, a lot of drunks, not my parents, I'm, I'm happy to say, but I had some unfortunate things happen to me as a child. Um, and um, I, I guess I'm, I've always had a, a knack for trying to keep people calm. Mm. Um, and um, the, so it just it, it worked for me with... Uh, he would have been a great agent. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it worked for me with, uh, with some 
uh, with some authors, they would give me um, somebody who had a big ego and who was very, very demanding, and they would say, well, Chuck, you, could you just take care of them? And fine, I, and I found that, you know, it's an interesting thing, I work with a lot of celebrities, uh, and, and so long as you treat them like children, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, you just, you, you, it's like, I, I like children, and they like me because I don't understand them particularly. I mean, I don't, want, I don't know how to talk to a child except like I talk to you. So I talk to a celebrity the same as I would talk to anybody else, just like, you know, who, you know I'm interested in you, just talk about it. And mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't get nervous around them, I'm not impressed by them, and they relax, so. Mm. Another thing you said, you said of Michael Corda, he is probably the most talented editor I have ever known. Mm -hmm. Tell us about how you got your job at Simon & Schuster, about working with Michael, and about what makes a brilliant editor. Well, uh, I was hired to work with Michael um, it, mainly because I had a reputation for being a line editor. A line editor is somebody who sits and, and, and it really does a lot of line work on, on manuscripts. A lot of acquisitions editors are good line editors. A lot of them are not. And a lot of them uh, give good lunch and don't know how to, <laughs> don't know how to, how to, how to edit. Um, and I was known for being a line editor. Uh, and Michael had had some personal problems and had gotten way behind with, with work. It was like stacks of manuscripts that had come in that he had not edited. And so I was hired to, to come and work on just for one year. I was not supposed to acquire anything. I was just supposed to do nothing but edit manuscripts that he had bought, that he had not had time to edit. Uh, and uh, when he interviewed me, he did ask me, uh, that's in there, he said, uh, what, do you, what do you think your greatest talent is? And I said, oh, I grovel well. And uh, <laughs> so I think, I think that's what, what he liked about me. Um, and and we, we had a great personal, we still have a great personal relationship. Uh, I loved working with him. He was one of the most inspiring people I've, I've ever worked with, I think, because when he is brilliant, he's absolutely brilliant. But when he focuses, which was not always the case, but when he focuses, and, and, and works with the writer, and, and I, I, I remember, and this is again in the article, uh, particularly one, one writer who was having a block on something, and he and I had been going back and forth, and I hadn't been able to figure out how to, where, he, where he should take the, the story, because it just wasn't, it, he'd reached a point and he couldn't get it around it. Mm -hmm. And we sat in with Michael, and, and we explained what the problem was, and Michael started talking, and just started going through from the beginning of the story, and just got to that block and all just went around it, just made it, just made, made the story go. And we're all, we're both sitting there like we could feel, you know, feel my hair rising up, you know, because I, I realized he'd, he'd solved the problem right mm -hmm. there. And he was just kept talking and took us through it. And we both just floated out of the office. We had the answer and I thought the brilliance of ki having that kind of conceptual mind that can just take these, these, these problems and work them out. It's just uh, amazing. I don't think like that. I am, I'm dogged. I just get in there and I, I kept chipping away, but he just, he just had a way of seeing the whole thing and, ma and making it work. And I don't, it's, it's a different talent. Mm -hmm. he's, got, he's, got, he's got the ability to be a great line editor. He doesn't do it anymore, but he, he's got this conceptual mind that's just amazing. And um, it's just not, it's, it's all too rare. You don't, most editors just don't have that. Uh, there are a lot of smart editors and they have a good eye, and, but to be able to really get in there and, and <coughs> work with the author and, and show them how to make their stories work when they're not working. It's just, it's, it's just rare. Uh, too much emphasis today, I think, uh, is on uh, having the, f the manuscript perfect when it comes in. In other words, if, if I bought something from Sally and it came, came in to me, um, uh, I, I, I'd give the, editor, uh, the author a few notes and it came back. And if it wasn't right, I might, if I were a house like Bantam, I'd probably reject it because they don't, they don't line edit particularly there. That's just not what they do. Uh, uh, they, they would say if it's, not, if it's not right, then we just have to, we have to let it go and they could try to sell it someplace else. Um, and more and more editors are doing that and authors are having to rely on their agents uh, to, or, or, or freelance editors to help them get the manuscript <coughs> in shape so that it, it can, can be ready to be published. I think what I was trained to do, I'm not saying it's, it's not going to, they're not going to continue doing it, but I think it's, there's going to be less and less of it because uh, there's just so much pressure on just cutting back in staff and uh, affording editors who spend months line editing something is probably going to be a thing of the past. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, the next question here is for Sally, and it comes from Andrea Langer, is that right? Okay, uh, and it's a great question. She asks, in a query or manuscript, what hooks you 
and keeps you reading? I guess it's a good good go to both of you. Mm -hmm. uh, in a query or manuscript, what hooks you and keeps you reading? Uh, conversely, in an ably written manuscript in your field, what makes you decide not to pursue a manuscript even if you're looking for new clients? So what hooks you when you, when you get a manuscript? Manuscript I can answer. I think she said query or a manuscript and it's kind of two different things. In a query it's all about just the concept. Mm -hmm. is, this, is this story idea something I'm interested in pursuing? And I suppose we're talking fiction. Of course if it's nonfiction, duh, it, it, is it going to fit my, my list and my taste and my interest? Now, manuscript, for me, it's all about character. If I cannot identify with that character in the first few pages, either through the voice, through the development of the character, through something that hooks me, I I'm gone. I, um, I love a good story, but if it doesn't have a person, or a dog, <laughs> or an <laughs> elephant, who hooks me, then I'm out of here. And that's just me. And when it comes to fiction, hmm. Um, every agent and editor has their own little personal subjective things, as we all do as readers. And, um, and there are some agents who, uh, it's all about the genre. If it, you know, <coughs> if it fits this formula, I'm, I'm there. But, you know, we all have our personal things. So since you asked me, it's all about the character. And what creates a compelling character? Well, it can be the voice. It can be quirkiness. It can be s uh, some sort of universality that speaks to me. I, it's very difficult to define that. It's sort of like that painting on the wall. I know I like it when I know I like it, but you know, um, it's kind of hard to define that here. I mean, I can, if somebody gave me a manuscript, I could point out why this didn't hook me, but without that, I'm, I, all I know is I've got to be hooked, and I've got to stay hooked to the very end. Hmm. There are a lot of manuscripts that work great for about the first 50, 60 pages, and I get all excited, <laughs> and then it loses me. But to me, it's, it's, um, it's about being compelled to read to the very end. Yes, because I like the story, but usually I like the story because I am compelled to follow this character who's got all these problems, and I, I love this character, and I want her or him to work these problems out, and I'm with them, you know, and that's what hooks me in a good story. How about you, Chuck? What, what hooks you when you get these manuscripts that says, I want to keep reading this thing? Well, voice, I think, it, to me, is the first thing, um, and relatable character, like Sally said, these are the, these are the two things that, that I look for first, and then uh, I'll keep reading, and if I feel like this is going to be a big enough story, you know, go enough, go, go, go enough places and, and, and make me enjoy myself the whole trip. Um, I'll keep reading all the way to the end. Every now and then I'll read an entire manuscript and decide not to pursue it. But usually if I've read an entire book, entire manuscript, it's going to be one that I'm going to want to buy. Uh, I don't finish the ma great majority of manuscripts because um, usually about page 20 or 30, um, I, it runs out of steam or I run out of steam. And uh, I just know it's, it's not going to you know, they, sometimes they also say, well, but it's got a great ending. And I said, well, that's, that's great, you know, but I just, I'm not going to get there uh, given all the roadblocks mm -hmm. that I, I ran into. There's so many things that writers can do, can do wrong that are just, it, it, it's so, mm -hmm. we read so much. Uh, we're constantly bombarded. Editors and agents are constantly bombarded with things to read. The, now that the internet's there, there's no, there's no stopping it. And, um, um, and I do look at, if, you, if I get, I get a lot of uh, e slush email and I look at it. I look at everything. I don't respond, I'm like Sally, I can't respond to all of it because it's just too much. But I do look at it and, and it's, it's the easiest thing for me to do is to say no. Uh, it's almost impossible for me to say yes. We published, Algonquin publishes 20 books a year, there are four editors. You know, you can do the math. I, I do about five books a year, um, unlike the like 30 or so I did a year at Simon & Schuster. And so I say no just about all the time. Uh, and it's so difficult for me to get to yes because before I, I, can, I, can, I can say yes for me, but I've got to get the publisher on, uh, to support me and all the, other, uh, uh, the rest of the staff to support me. So if you give me any reason to say no um, in the first few pages, that's probably what I'll say. Uh, and it's, it's, it, grammar has more and more has become sloppy. I think that p kids aren't being taught well today. I don't know what it is, but 
I can usually tell the age of the writer by, by whether the grammar is any good or not. And because and, uh, with younger ones, it's just not, it's not there. And if there's enough energy in the writing, and if there's enough, uh, the voice is strong enough, I might forgive it. But if it's not, then it's, that's going to be a no. It's just, it's, no is so easy to say. Mm-hmm. Got another interesting question here from Frederick Jones, who asks, in this economy, Will the book industry remain recession-proof? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think the book industry is, is recession-proof. I think you're going to see, I know that Random House is going to lay off an awful lot of people uh, next month. They've already kind of, you know, Merry Christmas. In November, we're going to fire you know, like 20,000 people. I don't know how many, like 2,000 people I think they're going to let go. Uh, and all of Random House, because it's, it's a huge, a huge conglomerate. And probably the same thing at Simon & Schuster. Um, because um, <coughs> books aren't selling right now. They're just not selling. Paperbacks are selling okay, but hard, hardcovers are not. Uh, it's, it's died for us, and if it's died for us, I know it's died for everybody. Uh, it's just right now, uh, it's a little bit like it was um, after 9-11. Any book that was published in September, October of 2001 died, just died. It didn't matter how great it was, or what the potential we thought going into it, it just died. And for a year after that, editors weren't buying much either. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And you're going to see, I've, the mandate's already come down uh, for us to, um, uh, over a certain level, uh, not that we have to go to the owner of the company to get approval, but really think hard about the money you're spending over a certain level. And um, it's, it's going to be, it's going to be more and more difficult. This question is from Lynn Hawks uh, for Chuck or Sally. Let's start with you, Sally. Uh, What do you hope to find in an author that will make for a good working relationship in terms of personality? So, you know, it's it's sort of the Jeff Herman's guide to to literary agents question of describe your dream client. My dream client is somebody who does everything I tell him to do (laughs) 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 without ever questioning. (laughs) But um, all of my clients are great. And and, uh, no, I I don't really want somebody to always do everything I say, but I want them to have a reason for not doing what I suggest. And uh, I'm I'm not that difficult to convince if someone has a compelling reason. Um, I have worked with to tell you the truth, the worst author I have ever worked with was one who, who came to me through an editor who said, this guy needs an agent. And of course, after the fact, I, I found out why this guy needed an agent, because <laughs> that editor didn't want to work directly with him. Uh, you know, I thought, oh, this is great. It's already been sold. I don't have to go sell it. I, but it ended up being the hardest relationship I ever had. Um, because this was someone who was uncoachable. He wanted to tell me how his book should be published. He wanted to tell his editor how his book should be published without any history of the publishing business or any willingness to listen. And so that's probably the most important thing. It's like anything else. You, you can't go out and expect to be a good tennis player without having you know, taken a lesson and had somebody teach you or something. Be teachable and pay attention. You know, and um, and then just be kind, be nice. You know, at the end of the day, I'd rather work with somebody who's nice. You know, that just goes without saying. How about you, Chuck? You've developed a skill set over the years of, of working with people that other editors might not prefer to work with. Uh, describe your dream client, and maybe the client from hell as well, um, or writer from hell. Well, dream, dream client for me is one who. Um, wants to work with me, who understands that, that I, I, first of all, I approach everything as a reader. I think, as an, I think my greatest strength as an editor is that I'm a really good reader. Um, and I sit down and I start reading the manuscript, and whenever I come to something that makes me stop, whether it's a word or whether it's something a character does, and I, it throws me off, I figure, okay, there's a problem here. I try to figure out what I think the problem is. And I will either go in and just with my pen make a change or I'll write a note saying this is not working right here we need it and so I throw it back to the, to the I do this all the way through the manuscript and I throw it back to the to the writer and the really good ones the ones that I the ones that I value so much are the ones who will listen to what I say but not to everything I say 
because I will suggest a change, and about half the time I'm right and half the time I'm wrong. And the, the really good ones are the ones who recognize when I'm wrong mm. and who will say, okay, I see what he's talking about. This is not working, but his suggestion is not going to work for me. It doesn't, it's not what I think my character would do. So they come up with something else. Um, uh, the worst, one well, of my worst experiences I ever had was, a, was actually a, a, a fairly big best-selling author. I was hired as a freelance editor on, a, on it uh, by my former boss at Delacorte years ago. I'd already gone to Simon & Schuster and she, had a, she was in a panic. She had to have this manuscript edited. And so I had a week of vacation. So I just took the manuscript. She paid me really well for it. And I, I just um, uh, edited the thing and sent it back. And that was it. I never had any more relationship. And I, the finished book came out. And he had done everything I had said. And it was, half of it was good and half of it was really bad. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I thought, well, th th he's not a good writer. He's just not. He's in, his instincts weren't, weren't there. Uh, he, he, he recognized the fact that, that he needed to make the changes and that was good, but he, he, made the, he made all of them just the way I said and I wasn't right all the time. So. Mm. Interesting. Uh, I asked a question sort of similar to this to, to Michael Connolly yesterday and his <coughs> response was, was very interesting on the TV show, so I'll pose it to you, Chuck, and then to Sally. Secondly, if a, uh, if a 30 year old uh, Chuck Adams walked in that door after this event and said, I want to buy you lunch. Uh, and you sat down with him and he said, you know, what advice could you give me about my career over the next 20 years? Uh, looking back over everything, what would you, what would you say to Is this to Chuck him? Adams, or, uh, the editor, or Chuck Adams an editor, you mean, or writer? The, the editor. Mm -hmm. The editor, oh. Mm -hmm. Well, what would I say to, uh, to an editor? Um, well, do you feel like I mean, do you feel like starving for a while? <laughs> <laughs> it's part of it. Um, I would advise. I, I I love this business. I love what I do. It's it's sometimes I can't believe I'm being paid to do it. I just have, and I finally have reached a point, even in Algonquin, where I'm where I'm well paid. I, I confess, I make a good living. Uh, it's the rewards are definitely there on a, whether you're making the money or not. I mean, work, getting to work with writers is just just awesome. Um, Getting, getting to work with, with creative people is just the most exciting thing in the world. And, and, and I just, I treasure what I do. And so as far as job satisfaction is concerned, I would tell this 30 year old, go for it, but be, be aware of, of all the pitfalls because there are so many. Um, it's, it's a lot of, there's a lot of sacrifice. Uh, it is never about the editor. It's never about the editor. It's never about the editor. Your name is never gonna be on the book. So you're not there to, to have your way with anything. You're there to guide somebody. You're there as the facilitator, if you will. You're there to make, make this manuscript as good as it can be within the limits of what that writer can do. It's never gonna be yours. You can't take it over. I did that when I was young. I had, I had the freedom of, I actually kind of made my name by, by stealing somebody's book. And I talked about this in the article too. Um, I, I was a managing editor and I wanted to be an editor and I was given the responsibility for movie tie-ins and there was a TV miniseries that I bought the rights to um, and the manuscript that came in was just horrible and couldn't be published. It was the, the guy couldn't write. Uh, it was an odd situation. The guy had come up with the idea for the miniseries. Someone else had written the script. He, but the guy who came up with the idea for the miniseries retained the right to not write the novel on the thing. And so, it was terrible, and, but he didn't, he didn't have approval over the final manuscript. That was the irony of it. The producer of the show retained it. So I said to the producer, I have to reject this, or I have to rewrite it. He said, well, rewrite it. So I just completely rewrote it, and really upset the author, because he thought I was destroying his career. He really thought I was ruining his life, and he, he was furious at me. The book went on to become a bestseller, mm. and, and I do think it was, it was only because you know, of the work that I, I mean, the TV series is what made the bestseller, but I mean, it wouldn't, it, it, it was a book, it couldn't have been a book the way he had written it. And I'm a good writer and I went in and rewrote it and I stole the book from him. I didn't get any credit for it. I didn't want any credit for it, except in house. I wanted them to know that I could do this mm -hmm. because I was, I was aggressive and I had, I had to make people know that I had talent and that was how I did it. Ironically, the, um, or not, I guess it should be expected, the uh, uh, author, because the book was a bestseller, got himself a big agent, Marchanklo, oh and um, <laughs> and got a, sold his next book uh, on a proposal to Phyllis Graham, oh 
And um, it came in, and of course, it was garbage. And it never got published. <laughs> and I felt, I felt bad for him. But. Interesting wow. story. That's a good story. So, is that the pizza delivery guy? <laughs> 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 so, same question to you. So, you're saying a young yeah, Sally it's kind of, you know, starting, uh, walked across well, What would you tell her? Stuff? Yeah, she's, okay. she's in front of you, you say, you know, you know a few things. What would you tell her now? Uh, you know, um, I don't know that this is a very meaningful conversation with this group. I think it would be better if, I, if it were a young writer, because these are all writers. But I'll just, I'll answer the question. I would probably tell her to be a little bit more courageous in going after clients. Um, if, if in my career, uh, I, I tend to be more responsive than proactive, and I think if I were 30 years and know what I know now, I would have been more proactive. But I really don't have a lot of gr regrets. It's a very something that you kind of had to pull right out of me today. Mm -hmm. I, like Chuck, I have loved my career. I've loved what I've done. It's been extremely rewarding. It's paid enough. It's not been a, you know, I'm not a wild success at it. But I've made a living at it, um, and it's it's just been extremely rewarding. I wouldn't give anything for it. Awesome. Well, just so that everybody knows where we're at time-wise and how this is going to sort of wrap up in a few minutes here, it's uh, we've we've been going for about 60 minutes. I, I want to push this to 75 minutes. I still got a bunch of questions here. I'd like to get through of, of your questions. There are, there are some excellent questions here. Uh, so we've got about 15 more minutes, uh, and then we're going to bring things to a close for today. Uh, a couple of things, the sign-in sheet. Has everybody had the opportunity to, to sign in the sign-in sheet? And then one other thing, I kind of want to help pay for gasoline for these folks today. Uh, Sally drove all the way from Charlotte here, uh, so if you don't mind putting a couple of bucks in the tip jar afterwards, this will be sitting up here. Uh, we greatly appreciate that. We'd love to keep this kind of series ongoing, obviously, and <laughs> having excellent speakers here uh, to inspire us. This next question comes from Sarah Merritt. Her question is, how important is an author's platform to an agent or editor? Which type of prior publish publications is most effective to build a platform for publishing a memoir? I guess this goes to you. Okay. Um, platform is extremely important, and um, for those of you who don't understand and they think it's like like us being up here on this platform, it really means your the audience that you bring to the table, your your ability to bring readers to to this this deal, and it varies. Of course, I, I, how many of you are writing nonfiction? Okay, so you're, it looks like it's about half and half, and today we've been primarily talking about fiction because Chuck is an amazing fiction editor, and so th there, that's the reason, I think. But for nonfiction, the platform is absolutely essential. Now, for fiction, and I would have to equate memoir, and I believe she did mention memoir in that question, <coughs> I would equate memoir a little bit with fiction just because that's the way the narrative is formed. It's not usually um, as platform based as, as nonfiction is unless it's a memoir about wrestling or mm -hmm. something. But um, platform is extremely important with nonfiction and, and much easier to acquire with nonfiction because you're usually writing about a subject matter. So it's important to become you know, uh, an expert in that subject matter and build your platform that way. When it <coughs> comes to fiction and memoir, really it's who you know, who you can con uh, contact with, who, um, some way you can build a readership. And I think today it's actually easier than it used to be if you can learn how to do it on the internet and create a, a, lo a blog or hook in with some website where you're helping them to write something and build a base. But um, I guess the bottom line is yes, unfortunately today in order to sell books it's pretty important <coughs> that you bring some readers to the table, you know, when you um, pitch your book out there. It gives me a perfect opportunity to plug uh, my website howtopublishabook.org which we get over 50 folks or 50 countries from around the world every month who are visiting this site if you're taking notes. Uh, this video, or at least a portion of it, will go up on that website, how to publish a book, all one word, dot org. 
Uh, a lot of the interviews, like the Michael Connolly interview I did yesterday, is up there already. Uh, so check that out. Uh, similar question. Well, how would you answer that? Does it matter to you at all oh, as yeah. an editor to see a platform? Oh yeah, I, I, I do. I actually do a, a lot of nonfiction also, although only narrative. I've never done uh, kind of prescriptive books. Uh, with prescriptive books, the platform is imperative. You've got to, if you're going to write a diet book, or if you're going to write about whatever, you, I mean, any kind of thing you're, you're trying to guide people. I mean, Dr. Phil, he's got a platform. Mm -hmm. He can write a book. Uh, but if, if you, you could probably write as good a book as Dr. Phil, but you don't have the platform. So, you know, it's, it's, so it's, it's critical uh, for, for nonfiction, for that kind. Less important, I think, for memoirs, because memoirs are more likely to be sold on the strength of the narrative, of the story, of the writing. Um, and um, if you happen to have uh, connections, that's great. But usually, most memoirs are just, are, are, are not, uh, don't have that going for them. Interesting question here from Jeffrey James. Uh, do endorsements help an author get the attention of an agent? That is, endorsements from doctors, therapists, et cetera, on a book about child abuse. But maybe answer the specific question of doctors, therapists, and then in a general sense, do endorsements, if you had James Patterson and Stephen King giving you an endorsement, obviously that would help grab the attention a little <laughs> bit. But how do endorsements factor into reading a query letter or grabbing your attention? Um, I get I get query letters and manuscripts sometimes with um, endorsements um, from other writers, and you know it, it catches my eye. I mean, it's just one more little ingredient that might catch my eye. Generally, the the real endorsements are done by the agent and or the editor uh, for the book's cover. But every now and then, a writer will come to me with endorsements. I don't know about the specific question with the doctors because it's not a subject I would take on. So. But I think, it, I think uh, endorsements like that might add some credibility to Absolutely. it. Absolutely, yeah. Hmm. Interesting question here from, looks like, Leo <laughs> Rattini, perhaps, or Lynn Rattini. Uh, is self-publishing a successful way to go? What, what would you say to folks who are considering traditional versus self-publishing, Chuck? Well, um, I, I don't have a lot of experience with self-publishing. I, I know a lot of writers have, have gone that route. And it's necessary sometimes if you really want to have a book published and, and you can't get a, a, a publisher or an agent to listen to you. Um, there are better ways now to be self-published, I believe, than there were in the past. Um, there's, is it Lulu? Lulu.com. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I, uh, Lulu.com, and there's, is it I, iBook? iUniverse. 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 Yeah. They actually, I, I've been told that they do a really good job for the, for the writer. The, 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 it used to be that anybody trying to be self-published were basically getting ripped off. And I believe these two organizations, that you can find them online, I think Lulu is actually here in Based Raleigh and Durham. Yeah, oh, I I believe they're are. actually building a headquarters on Hillsborough Street, wow. just a couple blocks from campus. Huh. Yeah, um, they are both really pretty reputable. And uh, I think you can, you can rely on, on them, I'm, what I'm told. I mean, I, I can't endorse them, I've but I've, just, I've heard that they're good. Mm -hmm. I think there are a few others too, but those two. Uh, but I, obviously, um, the best, way is to get a, a, a publishing house to take your book on because it'll be edited better, it'll be marketed better, and chances are it'll sell better. It'll reach a wider audience. But if you can't get, get there, then. And, and often uh, publishers do go and find self-published books, not often, but occasionally self-published books, and will then put them out later. Uh, I've seen that happen quite often, actually. I've actually done it. I mean, I have uh, marketed one of my best clients today originally self-published her book. It was a, uh, uh, a gardening book for vegetarians and it was uh, an amazing book. She went out and sold like six or eight thousand copies on her own and I ended up selling it to one of your companies, to Story, Garden Story? Way uh -huh. Story, which is owned by Workman who also owns Algonquin and now she's one of their um, authors. She's, she do, she's done several books for them. But um, Generally, I would say, just to add one thing to what Chuck said, if you're writing a book with a very, very clearly defined audience, like a book on the streets of Raleigh, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, where it's geographically defined, or <coughs> the audience is so clearly defined and easy to reach, self-publishing is not a bad mm -hmm. way to go. You probably could even make more money doing it yourself than using a publisher. 
but having been a regional publisher, I mean, I've gone down that road, and I can tell you that um, if it's a very small market, regionally, geographically, or with a very, very clearly defined audience, you can do better on your own if you're willing to do the work that it takes to do it. And with people like Lulu and I, Universe, it would be fairly easy to do. But if you're doing a novel or a memoir, you know, or even a prescription.